I really greet you in Lord's holy name. It's not just uh, for the sake of saying, uh, God bless you. God has given us a life. Even the previous Bible study, where Satish from Allahabad could join. He has come out from the hospital and he has come home. He's taking rest and he could join the Bible study. We are thanking God. But at the same time, we need to continue to pray for Sister Rosalind Sahu, who is in Bhubaneswar. In this morning, she wrote to us saying that she's still in ICU. In the evening, she has mentioned that uh, the one who was in the next bed in ICU passed away. So think of the uh, struggles she's undergoing. Already her husband passed away. And it's very sad. Not only that, many of our graduates and the church members and the full-time workers, they're all uh, struggling along with the Indians in our nation. Look at uh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, UP, and uh, Gujarat, Delhi, and all the other states where we see that uh, people are struggling like anything. We'll continue our study from the Book of Songs, uh, Song of Songs. Uh, today, uh, they are Shiny from West Godavari District. She'll be leading uh, in prayer for us, remembering the people who are suffering and also the time you're going to spend in God's word. Shiny? Let us yes. No, thank you for giving us this day. Thank you for bringing us together to study about the miracle. No, they thank you for teaching us many precious lessons each day from your word. No, today as we continue by the study from the book song of songs, speak to each of us. No, open our eyes and hearts to receive the word. Father, help us to understand and accept the truth and help us to apply it in our lives. Lord, I especially pray for the uncle. Lord, give me your strength and wisdom to teach us your word. Lord, this all this efforts to build our lives in your word. Lord, today, uh, I pray that may your name be glorified and honored through our lives, Father. Lord, this evening, I commit each of us and our Bible study into your hands. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Shani, for that uh, wonderful prayer. Yesterday, we started uh, with an introduction about uh, the Bible study. We need to be faithful to the text. And, uh, and we need to be relevant also. And uh, we thank God for uh, this lovely book. Just before this Bible study, where Joshua was mentioning, somebody has removed uh, from the Bible the pages of Song of Songs so that he doesn't need to uh, look at these pages. What a sad story it is. Uh, and uh, yesterday we spent too much time in the interaction part. We looked at various angles about this uh, relationship, about love, sex, and marriage. And uh, I'm thankful to God for uh, the good response, the way in which you are taking in. It is very much poetic, but still, there was a narrative, but more than the narrative, we need to look at this whole book as a poetic expression. Many imageries are used and words which are powerfully communicated in love affair or love relationship, it's very common. So we cannot simply compare with the uh, cinema or we, we cannot compare it with the uh, the present day love stories. No, not at all, not at all. That's what we saw yesterday. And then we looked at this aspect of Solomon's writing of the three books helps us to have a proper mind and to have a dedicated will and a real uh, heart with an emotion. All three should be a balanced one. That's what we saw yesterday. If my emotions are less, I'm in trouble. And definitely, if my emotions are too much, not controlled by my mind and will, I need to meet a psychiatrist. That's the way yesterday we saw that. So we need to be uh, a balanced Christian. In our churches and uh, in our uh, EU and EGF fellowship, 
when we are blessed, we need to bless others. We need to help. Yesterday, someone uh, sent a message to me uh, saying that uh, in their youth fellowship, the person can uh, talk about it. Thank God. I immediately sent a message. Thank God. If the church youth can, in a right perspective, learn these points, then definitely it will be very helpful. In our even EGFs, we have these programs uh, in, the pro, in the camps and in the programs we teach uh, in a right biblical perspective on sexual marriage. And also we uh, give enough literature, good literature for them to read. Yesterday I mentioned some of the books. I missed one more book, that is The Loud Language. That's an, another powerful book, a wonderful Christian writing. Of course, that's a Western uh, author. But other than that, it's a very good book, The Love Language. Some of my friends strongly recommend uh, it should be read by people who consider love, sex, and marriage together uh, in a very right perspective. We need to understand the love language. The devil, the world, talks about love language in a pathetic way. But we as Christians, we need to have the right understanding and we need to appreciate the love language. If you get a chance, I want you to read that beautiful book. Yesterday, we saw the uh, little more ideas or got perspective about love and beauty and also on sex, both from the biblical point of view and also in our practical uh, examples. In the end, we saw that our supreme love towards Jesus Christ matters. Everything should come under the supreme love for Christ. Anything or anybody cannot overtake us uh, by, taking the, by, by taking our love uh, above than our love towards Jesus. That we need to keep it in mind. Easy to preach and uh, in our day-to-day -day life, it's very important. Yesterday, I forgot to mention one more point. Uh, my young friends don't think that this is a problem of only young people. Oh, not at all. Many, many uh, elderly people also suffering a lot in this aspect. Mostly, they didn't, process the pro they didn't process the past properly. That's the reason elderly people are suffering a lot in this area. And already I'm talking about middle-age crisis. People are middle-aged. They are also struggling a lot. So in that way, it is not that only young people who are yet to get married are struggling. And this love relationship is a very, very strong um, factor. All of us have to be very, very careful. And I know some of us have bad experience of caught up uh, in um, same-sex uh, same uh, love relationship or opposite sex or past sex uh, uh, love relationship stuck up and we lost patience, uh, we lost our joy and peace with God and we have our own struggles. Please, please process it. Yesterday, consciously, I brought out the second question. You need to have a good mentor who can really correct you, scold you at the same time who can understand you. Think of it. Yesterday, we missed uh, taking time to go into the passage. We saw that uh, uh, some verses, but we didn't do full justice to the text. So I told you that today, quickly, we will go some of the points. Of course, yesterday, when we looked at chapter 2, we saw that uh, uh, that's what it is written. Immediately, don't take it to Christ, saying that uh, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys means not Christ straight away. In the literal meaning, she talks about him. Like that we have talked. And then yesterday I missed one verse that is verse 6. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. Very uh, important aspect here. The love relationship should uh, end in marriage. That's the reason in many of the Christian marriages, you can see that 
the pastors or some elderly people will come and say, the bridegroom, you have to stand. And the bride should stand in the left side of the bridegroom. You many, many, many marriages you might have seen. In the engagement before marriage, nobody will talk about it. In which side the bride has to sit out like that. But right after marriage, they will be very particular. The, hus the wife should stand in the left side of the husband. Why? This is a verse. So if you are supposed to help uh, others in standing in a proper way, a bridegroom or bride, you can keep that in mind. Left side of the husband, wife has to stand. That is just not only the uh, place, but I wanted to tell you the love relationship ends in marriage. That is important. This verse I wanted to highlight. Uh, don't think of you can experience such a love relationship outside of marriage. That's a point I just wanted to mention. And uh, yesterday we saw that the lady speaks and the gentleman speaks and friends are also speaking. That's another aspect. We didn't spend much time on it yesterday. Some of the points we see that uh, the friends are rejoicing. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. Who says? The friends are saying. And uh, there are other, other verses also we can see in this passage. So the mutual expression of love should be appreciated by your friends. In these days, that's another challenge I have in the churches and even in the society. Some of them fall in love and others cannot go near to them. And others cannot appreciate that. And others will be scolding. Not only their parents are scolding, even other friends will be scolding. Whenever this fellow comes, she's not talking to me. And uh, whenever uh, she comes, he's not talking to me. Like that, there are many, many complaints. That's very unfortunate. Your love relationship, people should admire it and then appreciate it. And as I'm just looking at here in this passage, one other thought I wanted to leave with you, the modern, or it is a, known as a post-modern culture. Somebody said 30 years back itself, modern culture has changed into post-modern culture. Now we are in the post-modern culture. One of the bad things I see in the love relationship in the post-modern culture is have 20 friends and uh, be close with five or six and leave everybody and get married to another person. My friends, I'm not joking. It has happened in my known uh, circle. Unfortunate, unfortunate among the believers. I'm happy that they have many girlfriends or boyfriends, 20. Good, that is good. Like uh, she is not very particular about one boy or he is not particular about one girl. They, they have many friends. That's very good. But becoming close with five or six, that is very dangerous. In the Western culture, they talk about dating. And in Indian culture, we don't much talk about it. Yesterday, we talked about courtship. That's what I'm talking about. Courtship is very important. Before marriage, the boy and girl should get to know one another, but not in an intimate way. No, not at all. The Song of Songs is not at all promoting such a thought in the courtship period. But the modern state, they say about it. You stuck up with one relationship, then you are not in a position to come out. And uh, then you end up your life utter confusion and you are making the other person confused. Your parents' names are spoiled. Your family name is spoiled and everything is confused. So be careful, my dear brothers and sisters, and please help your own context in such a way the uh, courtship period, it's only for people who can get to know, who are committed for mutual relationship. That's what we are going to look at today. United in love. Their mutual relationship should lead us into the united love. Otherwise, we can have many friends, nothing wrong in that. But don't uh, do some foolish acts and spoil your own sexuality and don't spoil 
your relationship with God. Don't spoil your peace of mind. That's what I wanted to tell you. Today, we're going to look at a beautiful aspect of it, united in love. It's going to be talking, we are going to talk about wedding, marriage. But before that, two passages talk about the search. Lovely descriptions. First, the man is searching. And the lady is talking about the gentleman. And then her search talks about uh, some uh, wonderful thoughts. And uh, wedding is in the third chapter. Till chapter 5, verse 1, we can look at different perspectives. The arrival of the groom is described in the first passage. And groom meets the bride. Lovely. And the wedding is over. Then they are leaving after the wedding. And the consummation, very important aspect of it. That's what I wanted to highlight in this study. We are going to look at the passage. It talks about... Uh, the bridegroom comes, that is uh, chapter 3, verses 6 to 11, and uh, how it is beautifully in a poetic way described. I'm so happy that uh, dear Joshua, an MBA graduate from Hyderabad, he is going to read the passage for us. Joshua? Yes, Angul, yes, Angul. I'm here. Yes. Yes, I'm reading uh, Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 6 to 11. What is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with mirror and uh, frankincense, with all scented powders of the merchant? Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it, of the mighty men of Israel. All of them are wielders of the sword, except in war. Each man has his sword at his side, guarding against the terrors of the night. King Solomon has made for himself a seed and chase from the timber of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of the purple fabric with its interior lovingly fitted out. By the daughters of Jerusalem, go forth, O daughters of Zion, and dig. Gazed on King Solomon with the crown with which his mother has crowned him on the way, on the day of his wedding and on the day of his gladness of heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. Let's uh, start from chapter 2, verse 8. Yesterday, we finished uh, about uh, the mutual love. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes. Here he comes. And leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. About the gentleman started searching for his sweetheart. And that's the way it's described. As I said yesterday, it is poetic, very much poetic. So in that way, uh, there are tremendous metaphors used. And... Um, Leaping over the hills and mountains could clearly describe about the obstacles and even the distance we could talk about. And uh, it's true that uh, when you are in love and we need to uh, go for the girl and go for the man and we have to leap over the hills and mountains. When you think of obstacles, there could be many. And uh, both a gentleman and a lady can have such an obstacles. Uh, I still remember before my marriage from USA to an office, when I go to my room, every day, evening, I will see a very big uh, uh, board where it is written, some advertisement board. It was written this statement. I forgot the advertisement, but this statement was stuck. For some people, things will go smoothly. For some people, things will go smoothly. So around 5.30 after my office, when I go back, I'll read the statement. And it's true. That's what I understood in my life and others' life. For some people, things will go smoothly about your love relationship. 
and then uh, fixing up your marriage. But for many, it is not true. Only is a statement. Many obstacles and uh, many challenges that it's a, a reality that we need to work on it. In verse 9, the word wall is coming. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall. It could be a physical wall, right? And it could be a metaphoric, uh, in a metaphor, it is mentioned very clearly there is a wall between uh, she and he. It's true, very true. For all of us, there is a wall that could be your family members, especially your parents, and uh, social constraints. We are all human beings. We are in the society. The social norms are there, naturally. When I was doing my MA sociology, I was thrilled. It was an eye-opener for me. In the sociology, I studied the marriage and the family. It's one of the social norms. Earlier, I was only looking at biblical perspective. Then later, after studying this MA sociology very late in my life, I was surprised to see how important it is. It is not that one boy and girl just run away and get married and uh, live happily. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. It is a social norm. And definitely there'll be a wall that we need to really process it. Verse 13, verses 11 onwards, we sing this, spring. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, and flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. Another beautiful metaphor. It is an universal uh, metaphor about the new beginnings. My friends, every time it is not rainy, every time it is not a dry summer, spring will come. Spring will come. A new beginning will come. That's a beautiful thought. Why do I say that? There are some people who are really down. Even when they are very young, they are really down because of one or other reason. And they think that everything has gone. That's the reason people commit suicide because of the love failure. We talk about it. We know that uh, the main reason for suicide is love failure. They think spring will not come. Finish and finish and let me die. Foolish decision, foolish decision. And spring will come and a new beginning will come. Even in a good relationships, there may be challenges, there may be uh, rains, but remember, spring will come. One more thought I have to leave with you in the part of the search. <coughs> there in 16 and 17, my beloved is mine, I am his. My beloved is mine, I am his. That's a lovely statement. You cannot tell it to everybody for that matter. It is for the togetherness, it's a first thought. And one commentator say, when we read this uh, sentence, when we read this passage, immediately we can remember Genesis chapter two, verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called women for she has taken out of man. You may immediately say, what is that? It's just a verse. But I tell you friends, when a man gets up from sleep and see a girl and then he can say, yes, she is going to be my life partner. Of course, in Adam's case, it's different because literally she came out of his bones. So he could say like that. But uh, metaphorically and spiritually, we need to know that. Let me give my own example. 1979, in summer, we had our EU leadership training camp very near to Kanyakumari. There's a place called Kotaram. And there was a deaf school. In that campus, we had a leadership training camp. And the preacher was um, former Scripture Union General Secretary. 
Mr. Stephen Abraham, a lovely man of God. He has just come back from the Bible college and uh, I forgot uh, many of his messages, but this verse, whenever I read, I remember his statement. He was telling, uh, a man should sleep, either it could be literally or even in a metaphorical way, we need to just relax. Don't look here and there and be anxious. Who is that Eve? Who is that Eve? You just relax. And then he said, a time will come. God will just wake you up. Gentlemen, get up. Then you get up and you see that there is a lady. And praise God, you are convinced she is my person. She is my person. Same thing for a, a lady also. We need to have such an experience where all of a sudden God confronts us and say that you have to pray about your marriage and then uh, you find out uh, the person, oh, he is the man. My brothers and sisters, I tell you, you may consider many, many factors for your marriage, but if it is a perfect will of God and if you are committed to the will of God, I tell you, that will be your experience. When you see that lady who is going to be a life partner, when you see that that man who is going to be a life partner, you will have a conviction that he is Adam. And you can say that confidently, she is Eve. And uh, you have to relax. That's what I'm saying. Be active in your church. Be active in your ministry. And continue to pray. As a third year become student, I was asked to pray for my marriage. My professor, believer, EGF member, and my seniors were telling us, now you are becoming a graduate. You have to start praying for your marriage. Don't pray for a girl. No, 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 not at all. Don't do that. But pray for your marriage that you will do the will of God. Make a commitment that at any cost, I will do uh, the will of God in my life in terms of choosing my life partner. So we were taught like that. Then we have to be active. Girls will come and go, but you need to be conscious that I made, I made a commitment to do the will of God. Let me give one more interesting example. I love the uh, Saktit Rao. The Saktit Rao was from Andhra Pradesh, and uh, he is a man of humor, such a humorous person. By looking at him, we can laugh, like the way he'll be talking. And he was uh, one of our first staff workers. The PC Vargis, Another staff worker, he was taking care of the North Indian ministries. But Sakit Rao was a staff worker taking care of South India whole. Very active. He left his teacher's job and then joined in USA staff team. And very actively involving. One day, he took the quiet time. Then God spoke to him about marriage. That was on a Sunday. Then the Sakit Rao said, Lord, I'm very actively involving in ministry. Now you are talking about my marriage. Then he prayed a very simple prayer. Lord, I'm going to the church today. If the pastor will talk about marriage, then I will take it. This is your will for me to consider marriage. Then he went to the church. No wonder. <laughs> he had a message very clear on marriage. Then immediately he started praying and beautifully he got a beautiful wife and they had a wonderful ministry, not only with USA, with Evangelical Fellowship of India, and he's no more, but uh, such a powerful servant of God. My dear brothers and sisters, sleep and time will come. You can confidently say, she is my beloved. I am. Same thing. You, you can also say, he is my beloved is mine and I am his. Let's go forward. When we talk about her search, we see that in chapter three, only in four, four verses or in the fifth verse talks about in general terms of motivating others. The word, the one my heart loves comes in a very clear sense. The one my heart loves. That's a dream. And then uh, she goes out and even to the watchman. The watchman found me as they made their round in the city. Have you seen my heart loves? Very interesting. A girl goes and asks a watchman, uh, have you seen 
the one my heart loves. If you are that watchman, you will really laugh at her. You become a mad girl. What you're talking about? But what I want to communicate is uh, to that level, it is focus on love. The one my heart loves. My dear friends, in these days, such a love is lacking. Because of various reasons, we need to ask this question, why our boys and girls don't have such a holy love, the pure love? Because of the influence of media, because of various reasons. Right. Secondly, we see that there was a desperate search on hell. Where is he? Where is he? I told you earlier that we need to relax, but when you are falling in love, nothing wrong, keeping a wall and keeping the limit, searching for love. One more thought here we have to make note is any love relationship will have the seasons of separation. Please make note of it. You are not an eternal uh, love relationship. No, that is only in eternity we have love relationship with Jesus Christ. In this world, there will be a season of separation. You love a boy, you love a girl. And because of the studies, because of the job, because of other reasons, there will be a season of separation. And uh, the genuine search is very important. I was in a particular Bible college. And in my third year, I was to be part of the uh, student body. Five of us are known as officers. I was a treasurer for my uh, student uh, body association. And then president, vice president, secretary, um, treasurer, and ministerial in charge. Five of us are known as officers. One of our main responsibility is uh, to check the boys and girls for falling in love in the Bible college. Because that will spoil the name of the Bible college and some of the parents will be deeply upset. So uh, very natural. I can go on with a very, uh, in a lighter sense, I can say some, uh, some girls uh, will be considered by 10 boys saying that this is God's will for me. This is God's will for me. Then we have to call that boy and have to counsel him. Almost like scold him and send him back. And one of the things normally the Bible college will do is have a season of separation. Send a girl or send a boy in a right way to be separated for six months or one year if they are very much in strong love relationship. Then one year later, if it is growing, then we can decide. In these days, because of the mobile phone and other things, uh, uh, in, a, in a nasty way, uh, some of the love relationships are growing and it's breaking just in one week's time or one month's time after the marriage. It's so sad. But the seasons of separation should be handled properly. That's what I wanted to communicate to you, my dear brother and sister. Don't think eternally I'll be uh, in the high spirit only. There'll be a time where you have to be away from her, away from him. Right. Here we see that uh, she found out him. Then she takes him to her mother's house. That's what it says. She takes him to her mother's house. It's a beautiful thought. That means it is not that immediately she can go and get married and run away with him. That's what exactly some of the boys are doing. Some of the girls are also doing. Very sad. Very sad. Of course, uh, I'm not saying that immediately you have to take the boy to a, your mother's home. The, the metaphorical statement is your parents are involved in that. Your uh, community is involved with that. Uh, maybe for some of you, that your parents are not in a position to help you. The community of your church, the community of you and each of it's so important, so important. It's not that one boy loves a girl and just they run away, not possible. You have to make a commitment in the home or in the community, very important. She takes him to her mother's house. It's a beautiful thought. 
I know that I'm talking to many of my young boys and girls. Be careful. You want to do the will of God. Praise God. And relax. And uh, uh, be careful. I know some of your parents will not agree because you're from other faith and because of your uh, social uh, uh, discriminations, because of your economical status. In her case, it is true. Imagine you are the mother of this girl and Solomon is coming to your house. My goodness, her mother will look at him and say that why you brought this richest fellow in our country? Why you need that person? Please leave him. Same thing. You may be rich or you may be poor. The economical status and uh, the caste and various other things are challenged when you take this proposal to your mother's place. But still, she did it. One more thought in this passage. The assertiveness of the women is beautifully communicated here. In the commentary, yesterday I was telling you, in South Asian context, the commentators say the man has an assertiveness. But in women, we don't see such an assertiveness. That's uh, what commonly speak, uh, spoken. But from my experience, I know things have changed a lot. Those days are gone. A woman cannot say anything. She has to be quiet. Somebody will come to the house and uh, he, he, she has to go and give the coffee or tea to him. And he will look at you and say that I like this girl. And then the marriage will be fixed. And she cannot say anything. She does not know anything about him. Only thing she knows that he is a man. That's all. And she cannot say anything. And only after marriage, she has to get to know him and then live with him. So assertiveness is not at all possible. And there, I hate that idea. A girl will become an idol. Many fellows will come to the house and say that yes, and then no, and then they'll say yeah, no, and then they'll think where they will consider. They make the girl as a commodity. Very, very sad. Anyway, now these things are changing. Even uh, nowadays, people look at the girls and the churches. They go to one particular church. When they ask, why did you go to the church? They'll say that to see the girl. Very bad, very bad. Right. These are the uh, nasty things that are happening around in our circle. But my point here is, nowadays, I'm thankful to God for my dear young girls who are assertive. According to my uh, understanding, girls are more assertive than boys. That's a, a sad story. Why? Boys will be very happy to consider her. Then when we pro proceed further, they will come and say, Uncle, that's not God's will. When you are uh, talking to them a little more, then he will say gently and quietly, my mother says, don't consider her. Why? Because she has a spectacle or she has a, a short hair or she has this and that. Unfortunate, unfortunate. Even very recently, there was a, a, um, almost like engagement level. It was supposed to come. It's broken. They are from different districts. I, I want to scold my believing friends, not that particular people. I want to, uh, I'm angry with the believers. How dare they can think that boy is from other district. So my girl should not get married. My dear brothers and sisters, assertiveness is very important. Both for men and women are needed. I'm happy that there are many sisters are participating. I know my sisters, it is not very easy in your own context. And some of you are Hindu converts. Very challenging, very challenging. And there you have to be assertive and taking a decision is not very easy, but pray that God will give you strength. The arrival of the groom. A few minutes back, Joshua read the passage for us. And uh, 
she describes the approach of her fiancé. It is talking about smoke and things like that. We need to understand in a night, uh, the poetical metaphor, when he comes and he comes in the houses and dust is coming like a smoke in a glorious way, the groom arrives. It's a grand procession. And the third point I wanted to stop and explain. His escorts are visible manifestation of his power. 60 men are coming with Solomon, the carriage, and the 60 men are um, very strong people. Everybody is wearing the sword, very strong people. That's the way she this, the poem describes about the arrival of the groom. Now, uh, how to bring it to a context? My young, uh, dear gentlemen, don't be like Solomon taking 60 uh, people. You are not going for a war, right? What is your power? I would say the power is in your inner man. Are you a person of integrity? Are you a person of uh, uh, self-respect? Are you a person having a strength in your inner being? I don't see many of my young friends have such a capacity. My dear friends, you have to go to your girl's uh, family or you have to go for your engagement, such a power. By looking at you, people have to respect you. Not because of your dress, not because of the jewels you are putting. No, not at all. Because your character shows that you are a man. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. So you know, in a being, you need to be strong. Number two, you are uh, power shows with your friends, the people around, not in number. 60 people, hopeless people are around you means that is not your strength. Even if you are going with five people, if, they are, if you are going with right people, I tell you, you have the power. Let me give an example. A few years back, <clears throat> I had a rare privilege of helping one gentleman to go and uh, meet the girl's family members. That has happened in a place called Tanju, near Trichy in Tamil Nadu. And um, this gentleman is uh, involving with full-time ministry, so we really wanted to help. And another full-time worker has very well uh, did every groundwork, and I was going with the bridegroom. My brothers and sisters, I tell you, when we reached Tanju, we got ready, and uh, two cars came, two doctors, Quite a big car. Two doctors took us in the cars to the girl's house. She's from a village background, brilliant girl and smart girl. And uh, all of them are Hindus. And she's the only Christian. But when we went there, they could respect the bridegroom because of the doctors who took time and who showed their love to us this gentleman. They don't know him. Through the staff workers, they came to know about him because they love that girl so much and they did it. That's a beautiful expression of both the parents are not that much rich, but the bridegroom goes with respected people. My dear brothers and sisters, that's what we talk much in USA Fellowship how much it's needed for showing our power, not outwardly, inwardly, we are part of a fellowship. Inwardly, we have an inner strength, work on it. Later, she talks about the crown, that's a glory. The groom greets the bride. Chapter four, verses one to seven. First, he explains, or he uh, was exclaiming, her beauty. Yesterday itself, we talked about it. Uh, the words in which he describes each part of her body, even the teeth, very interesting. Teeth, very important. Your eyes, very important. Please make note of it. Sisters, don't think only the uh, 
things like breast and other things only it's uh, covers. No, not at all. The eyes, it starts with that. Your eyes should be bright. Eyes should communicate. Smiling face, teeth. These are some other things I want to highlight. Then he looks at her strength. How do we say that in verse 4? We see he talks about the uh, way in which he describes about her neck. Your neck is like the Tower of David. What does it mean? The neck gives the strength for the head. And uh, some of us don't have strength, our inner being, so our neck is very down. And some of us wanted to show our neck with our gold. In some of the marriages, especially in Christian marriages, and that also, unfortunately, uh, in my cultural background, we cannot see the neck at all for the girl's side, filled with gold. Either it may be an own gold or it may be uh, taken for a loan. They might have taken it only for the marriage. It's almost like an idol, an idol sitting before us. The neck we cannot see, only with the gold we can see. But Solomon could describe about her neck as a strength. That means she could look up and respect her. And then he could say in a very powerful way, his beloved is flawless. That's an important point I want to tell you. His beloved is flawless. How it's possible? Because all are human beings. Nobody is an angel. Nobody is an angel. And Solomon knew pretty well that any girl in this world cannot be an angel. Otherwise, then we have to talk about a different story. And she is a human being. How come she can say, my beloved is flawless? One thing I want to say that he was really satisfied with her. Her height, her color, her beauty, everything shows that flawless. Maybe if you look at her, you will say that her uh, face is little black. For Solomon, she, he cannot consider a black girl like this. That's what she says in first chapter verse 6. I am black. And for some of the boys here in our country, even among the believers, girls should have only fair uh, face. Very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. So the flawless comes from the boy's point of view in a right way. That's what I wanted to communicate. My brothers and sisters, take note of it. The inner beauty is very, very important. In the Song of Solomon, I wanted to bring that First Peter chapter 3, verse 4. The inner beauty is so important. When you see her, look at a satisfied look, flawlessness. Then comes the marriage. We don't read about how the marriage is fixed, um, uh, how they're conducted, but we could see that the marriage is over. Because we look at chapter uh, 4, verse 8. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. It's the first time she is saying that word bride. Later, of course, he is using that word sister. In the culture, uh, it's okay to tell the wife as a sister. But the bride has come. So that means they are leaving after the wedding. And the word Lebanon, four times it comes in this passage. What does it mean? It's a long distance from Jerusalem. Yesterday we saw that 50 miles away. These days, 50 miles is just nothing. In one hour time, you can easily reach there. But those days, uh, a person like uh, Solomon going 50 miles away to get married to a girl, that's a big, big thing. And Lebanon, beauty. And Lebanon, strength, all it talks about. Then comes um, the word garden. Here the garden talks about sexuality, the chastity. Very important. The greatest needed virtue of the bride. She's pure. And uh, the bridegroom could rejoice in that. It's not only chastity, it's only for bride, for the bridegroom also. That shows your sex life 
is like a garden. It should be protected. Only in marriage, uh, your spouse can enjoy that garden. So my dear brothers and sisters, the Song of Solomon is really a great song. Talks about purity and the, the fulfillment which a man and women consciously in the fallen world take a stand. And an ordinary garden becomes the finest spices. The smell, the beauty in the garden is exhibited. We need to go forward. That talks about the marriage relationship uh, in a unique way. Paul beautifully writes in Ephesians 5.31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the, they two become will one flesh. The two become one flesh. That is the unity. So when you think of the garden, and there comes the uniqueness, the uniqueness. And uh, it is a mystery. The next verse, that's what Paul says. It is a mystery. The secular world can talk about it. The film can talk about it. Uh, others can talk about it, about sex life. But Bible says the two will become one flesh and that's a mystery. And there the consummation comes. And uh, the way in which beautifully inviting him to enter her garden. And uh, the commentators say, now the camera is gone and they are alone. That's the way it is beautifully communicated. So far, everything is in poetic form and then camera was mentioning uh, taking the photos and now they are alone. And chapter 5 verse 1 that shows the satisfaction in each other is highlighted. Beautiful. Look at that. Chapter 5 verse 1. Nine times the word might comes. Ninefold repetition of that possessive my comes. Just being in the first night and just being with that girl and just being with that man, I was admiring. I could come out and tell my friends, that's what it's happened. Eat, drink, eat friends and drink. Drink, uh, you are full of love. The husband comes out and the wife comes out the next day morning and says that, uh, my mm. friends, rejoice with me because I have that possessive my is fulfilled. That's beautiful. So if it is so, how much young people should be very much aware of preparing for the marriage? And those who are married, you may not go back and remarry. No, not at all. But how did you prepare for your marriage? I did it very carefully. Even I planned for my wedding service. I told you already, we had a holy communion service in our marriage. In every aspect of it, I wanted to plan. I didn't like to waste any money for dress and things like that. I was carefully planning in every aspect of it, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and uh, socially, uh, spiritual, in every aspect of it. And my young friends, that's what I want to tell you. Do you consciously prepare for your marriage? Secondly, what are the struggles I have for the committed for mutual love? When you're talking about committed mutual love, what are the struggles I have? Maybe you are past failures. Maybe because of your cultural background. Maybe because of your uh, 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 immature spiritual commitment. Think of it. Think of it. In what are the ways in which I could help other believers in this area? I challenge each one of you. It's not only for you. It is for others. Please take this message and help those who are suffering in a wrong way in considering sex, love, and marriage. Let's continue our study. Now we'll let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the great message we receive from the Song of Songs. You have made Adam and Eve still 
you are making Adams and Eves among the believers, those who are committed to do the will of God in their lives. Thank you for the beautiful arrangement of marriage. And thank you for the consummation of the marriage. As we study here, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are yet to get married. Help them to be conscious of it and to be uh, pure for that day, for that great day in their life. And also help my brothers and sisters to help others, those who are in struggle in these areas. Continue to minister to us and give us good night rest. In Jesus' precious name, we humbly pray. Amen.